Nexus Motion presents The Way of Movement Professionals. Conversations with world-class physical therapists and other industry experts. Hi everybody, this is Michael from Nexus Motion. Today I'm thrilled to have some time here with Dr. Claire Frank. Thank you so much, Claire, You're uh, very for having me visit you. It's an honor. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, Dr. Claire Frank is a physical therapist. She is a board certified orthopedic specialist, as well as a, let me get this right, fellow of American Academy, Academy of uh, Manual Therapy. Uh, and she is a director uh, currently at the fellowship program uh, for movement science at Azusa Pacific University, as well as an instructor at the Kaiser Permanente Fellowship Program. So uh, it's, it's been uh, many years since I've gotten to know you, Claire. Yeah. And uh, it, I think it was just at one of the combined sections meeting that we met. That's right. Um, thank you, Michael Miller, for uh, making the introduction. And ever since, I've, I've followed you. Uh, uh, taking several of your courses as well and, and learn from you. So I'm lucky to say she's one of my mentors in physical therapy. So yeah, thanks for being here. Oh, thank you. Yeah, um, we'll, we'll get started with a bunch of questions and I, I just want this to be a, a fun little conversation. That's right. Yeah. I think I liked it as a conversation rather than an interview. <laughs> <laughs> sure thing. Um, what, what I want to do uh, with this session is to uh, have a lot of the therapists and movement professionals from around the world get to know Claire and what makes her so great um, and get to know her a little bit more on a personal level. Uh, so we'll get right to it. Why did you become a physical therapist initially? I actually didn't know what physical therapy was because where I was in Malaysia, where I grew up there, uh, I don't think they even had physical therapy. Or if they did, I did not know. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but because of my involvement in sports in badminton, I, uh, because of injuries, that's kind of piqued my interest. And so when I went, when I moved to, when I went to Northern Illinois University, that's where I went to do my PT school. Um, I actually start to volunteer at the clinic to figure out what physical therapy was, and that's where I figured that's what I want to do. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So learning about physical therapy in college. Yes. 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 Um, yes. Before considering physical therapy, I was actually uh, really involved. I thought I was going to pursue sports medicine, even though I didn't really quite know what it was. Mm -hmm. But when I saw what was happening in the physical therapy clinic, I figured that's what I really want to do. Yeah. Yeah. It, there's there's always uh, that common theme. I think many yeah. of my physical therapy classmates too. They had several injuries. Yeah. I myself went through some injuries mm -hmm. in collegiate sports. Um, so yes, that's a that's a great place to start because you experience okay. it yep. your own. Yeah. Um, what's your favorite part about being a physical therapist? I think, first of all, meeting people. Mm -hmm. I think people are just fascinating. I I'm always thrilled to get to know not just my peers and fellow physical therapists, but I just patients. I think everyone has a story and it's kind of very interesting to actually, as I'm gathering information from them, the data to treat them, but also finding out what makes them tick mm -hmm. as a person. So mm -hmm. that excites me because I've, I feel much as I learned from my teachers, I actually learn much, much more from my patients themselves. Mm -hmm. uh, I feel many times if we listen enough to the patient, they are actually telling you what the problem is and how to actually treat them mm -hmm. but you got to listen and I think that's the tough part because most of us want to do something mm -hmm. and don't spend enough time listening mm -hmm. and getting to know the patient as a, a person rather than just seeing them as a shoulder just to look at the shoulder mm -hmm. so anyways People fascinate me. <laughs> yes, yes. I think one of the best moments in, in the clinics is, you know, you find out, oh, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not there yet connecting yeah. to the patient. And then there's this one moment mm -hmm. 
I, I changed the way I cued or, right. or I found out a little bit more about their yes. background story of mm -hmm. their past experiences and then somehow things click and, right. and it all comes together, they get it mm -hmm. and they start moving differently. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, isn't that cool when you can learn? I learn so much from my patients. Mm -hmm. oh. Absolutely. Um, now on the other side, what do you think are the current challenges that physical therapists face in the U.S.? I think um, one of the biggest challenge is trying to do what we've been trained and do it well in the clinic because of the constraints that we have um, as a profession as well as of insurance mm -hmm. reimbursement issues. So that's been a, I think that's been an uphill battle for a lot of physical therapists. Mm -hmm. I think it's quite discouraging for a physical therapist to have all this knowledge and all this training and, and not able to actually do what they've been taught and to practice the way we have been trained in. Mm -hmm. um, and so it, I feel for the, the young PTs these days. Mm -hmm. Uh, with a massive amount of loans that they have That's true. going through so much of school and having to put in all that work and not able to fill uh, not I won't, I won't say all but uh, to to be fulfilled mm -hmm. yeah so so I really admire and I tip my hat to any of the young PTs who are out there still loving what they do because that's uh, all of us went into our profession into PT because we love what we did. Mm -hmm. we, 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 we pursued it because we want to help people mm -hmm. and I hope that passion continues. That's so true and you know I'm lucky enough that at where the clinic where I work at yeah. we're given an entire hour That's for right. our new patient uh, and then thereafter the follow-up mm -hmm. I have one-on-one -on -one time at least half an hour oh, that's nice. with my patients but that's not the case with many of the, that's right. the clinics around so yes. yeah that's very tricky. Yeah. Now I love the saying that you're the average of five people no. you surround <laughs> yourself with and uh, so for you, who are the five people who influence you the most? I would say, right, I mean, of course, um, first off the bat's my mom. <laughs> I mean, I think my mom has instilled a lot of the uh, feeling empathy and compassion for mankind, mm -hmm. for the human race, for my neighbors, for anyone who's walking down the street. So I tip my hat to her because mm -hmm. And then the people have influenced me professionally, mm -hmm. uh, Dr. Shirley Sarman. Mm -hmm. uh, I heard her speak at the conference one year out of school, and I was just fascinated. This, this was in a room of a couple thousand people. Oh, wow. Um, my first PT conference, I would say, and sh just hearing her speak just made me want to delve much more into the muscular system. Yes. So at that time, you know, there were no, she didn't have no books. Nothing was out yet. This was in the 80s, okay. early 80s. Yes. <laughs> so I took furious notes listening to her. Mm -hmm. And she basically kind of, through the talk, I was challenged to go learn my anatomy, back to basics. Mm -hmm. uh, learn my anatomy and kinesiology, but apply it in a, in a more, like, how would I say? Um, uh, with new eyes yes. so that I could actually apply in with patients. Mm -hmm. So I would say she was a big influence and I know Shirley has a big influence in you, sorry, with you as well. Yes. So Shirley I would say has impacted so many people whether she knows it or not. Mm -hmm. She is definitely my, he my, my hero. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, and shortly after that I, I met Dr. Yanda Vladimir Yanda, who opened another door in my understanding in, the, in PT, looking at the CNS as the driver of every movement, mm -hmm. looking at slings and chains. And so because of his influence on me, it was really hard for me to just see uh, movement as isolated. 
how he, I would say, even those years in the 80s, and when I heard him speak, mm -hmm. I w he already was introducing to me what we would call regional interdependence these days. Mm -hmm. So that I'm totally grateful to him. Through him, he introduced me to all the Prague school. And mm -hmm. uh, where is Dr. Yanda from? Dr. Yanda is from Czech, Czechoslovakia at that mm -hmm. time, okay. uh, which is now Czech Republic. Yes. Um, so he was a big, he would act, he, I would say, was a, another key person that uh, introduced me to understanding the movement system, even on a more on a neural, on a CNS level. Mm -hmm. And then through him, uh, he going to, to Prague and learning from him, was introduced to all the other Prague mm -hmm. many of their um, physical medicine um, doctors. Mm -hmm. So Dr. Levitt was being one of them. So I was very privileged. I was like, I don't, you know, sometimes you can, I just say I was very lucky and very blessed to have met like Shirley, Dr. Liana, Dr. Levitt mm -hmm. early in my PT career. Mm -hmm. So those big three, the big three. Yes, <laughs> yes. Well, and certainly when, when, when you're ready to learn and, and you're yeah. so motivated to learn, I think those opportunities come That's right. for you. Uh -huh. yeah. And then, you know, of course, you know, because of the Prague School, I was introduced to Dr. Kolar, yeah. who is the developer of the DNS, mm -hmm. uh, Dynamic Neuromuscular Stabilization, which mm -hmm. is another level of understanding. And then went on and learned even more through the Voita Institute. So there I go, never end. <laughs> <laughs> Learning never ends, right? <laughs> Wait, so you were recently in Germany. Yes, yes. I just finished a two-year course, two-year program. Congratulations. Oh, thank you. Yes. Well, yeah. It's very, very challenging, very rigorous, but all worthwhile. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Well, and, and you guys should know too that Claire teaches nationally and internationally, and, and for someone like her to still be uh, taking classes and, and, you know, furthering her study, that's uh, one of the reasons why I continue to absorb from everything that I can from her and try just try to follow people that, you know, that you really want to learn from. I think that's very important. That's very nice of you mm -hmm. to say that. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I really mean it too. Um, so in your mind, what are the ideal qualities that would make an excellent physical therapist? I think the um, teachability and the humility. Mm -hmm. um, to me, those are really big. To me, those are like character, char character, character, um, characteristics that I actually look in a, a physical therapist. Knowledge is really good, of course, but at the same time, I think nothing can replace the human part of mm -hmm. our profession, where uh, to be a good physical therapist, you need to have a lot of uh, kindness, as I would say, mm -hmm. Uh, mm -hmm. and empathy, and um, so how else can I say except yeah. uh, looking for what, what will make the person really good? Of course, I'm not saying you only need the kindness and empathy and then have uh, and you <laughs> don't know what you're doing. Mm. And I, I do not mean that. Sure. Uh, I think the combination would be the, the best. Mm -hmm. that's, that will be the best match. Um, yes, because somehow we can't just be like the best test takers yeah. or the uh, best students in school and not connecting with the person right in front of you right. yeah. um, because they won't be able to absorb what you're trying right. to teach them. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, totally. I think we've practiced enough times that we know when we have talked over someone's head <laughs> if the patient just do as told mm -hmm. but have not much understanding. Mm -hmm. And I always find that if the patient, if you can really get the patient, get the buy-in not just from why they why they're doing what you asked them to do, but if they know that you care for them, there is an element where they will want to actually step up as well. Mm -hmm. And so I feel that it's a great motivating factor for me to get better at first to be list to be a good listener. Yes. And the other thing is how do I connect with that person? That's huge. Uh, it's huge because everyone has a different um, capacity to connect. Mm -hmm. And so there are some folks, I think you've all experienced where 
you need to earn your trust mm -hmm. <laughs> before mm -hmm. you can really speak into the situation. Mm -hmm. So I think that's my biggest goal when I'm working with a patient. It's like they've come to me because they are seeking to get better. Mm -hmm. They are looking for uh, some outcome. But at the same time, if I can get them to understand the background or the causes of why they're having this persistent pain or dysfunction, mm -hmm. that will be a better uh, outcome for me because I can convince them, not just me, mm -hmm. but they can convince themselves this is what is to happen. Yeah, uh, definitely. So, um, I hope that made sense. Oh, totally. <laughs> yeah, and, and we are in the people business. Yes, exactly. Sure. Yeah. yeah. Uh, now, you've been teaching in the fellowship programs, uh, originally at Kaiser Permanente and now at Azusa Pacific University. So congratulations for getting Thank that you. program started. I'm sure that was um, a lot of effort and work yeah. put into it. But why do you think it's important for physical therapists to uh, participate in, say, residency yeah. or fellowship yeah. programs? I think just like um, when you first get out of school, many of us come out of school what I call newbies, if you want to call them. Mm -hmm. well, we think we know a lot because we're book smart. We we basically pass all the tests so that can earn our doctorate. At the same time, uh, the experience is something that's lacking. And so, I feel the residency program I mean, is a like let's say the one year programs or the concentrated year of learning, where you're actually working one-on-one -on -one with your mentor, mm -hmm. that accelerates your growth mm -hmm. because now you're being challenged in your critical thinking. Why do you do what you're doing? And then, of course, you know, a lot of us, uh, what I've seen is I feel when you come out of the residency program, you're, in some ways, you've accelerated growth to two or three, four years mm -hmm. than when you're on your own. Mm -hmm. I mean, perhaps I'm wrong, but this is what I, I feel you, it basically accelerates your growth mm -hmm. as a critically thinking therapist. Mm -hmm. And then those who uh, want to advance the skills even more opt to go to the fellowship programs mm -hmm. where then the fellowship programs are more advanced training in specialized areas, let's say sports, and in our case it's mm -hmm. the movement system. Yes. And so I think the movement system has always been my my, my passion mm -hmm. and so to me the movement system encompasses anywhere from pediatrics all the way to geriatrics so we all move so <laughs> like Shirley would say yes uh, we should be all, as life to death mm -hmm. practitioners and mm -hmm. so that's how I would like to see myself as as a lifespan practitioner that when someone comes in with a dysfunction or a pain mm -hmm. I'm there to analyze um, what caused the breakdown and maybe find the areas where the breakdown is and give options to the patient, to the client, to increase his variability of movement so he doesn't keep breaking down over and over again. So, so true, yeah. So that's where I feel like um, I always tell new grads, there's nothing stopping you from doing the residency. Mm -hmm. Now, during the time when I was going to school, there were no such things as residency. Mm -hmm. So I either flounder myself, flounder around, for eight years, basically, mm -hmm. with, uh, taking Con Ed courses. I'm not saying Con Ed courses are, 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 not, are not good. I just feel like uh, you are on your own trying to implement what you've learned on the weekend. But when you have the accountability from the mentor, <laughs> that makes a big difference. Because now, not only do you have to exercise what you learn in the classroom, but you have someone looking over the sh your shoulder. Right. <laughs> you know right. what I'm talking about. Yes. <laughs> and that makes you actually want to step up. Mm -hmm. uh, you just can't come in the clinic thinking, oh, I've got this, it's all in my head. But if I always tell my, my fellows or my residents, um, you've got, I know all of us have a lot of knowledge. You can Google the knowledge from anywhere. But can you translate that knowledge to your hands, mm -hmm. or to your eyes? Mm -hmm. Uh, that, I think, is an art that and is. a skill. 
I, you, you said it right. It is an art to it is put it art. all together. Yes. Yes. And it could be a little different per mm -hmm. patient because each individual is a little yep, different. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I, I think, w would you also say that, you know, as an instructor in the residency fellowship program, that we get just as much, if yes, not more, out definitely. of, uh, you know, the actual residents and the fellows yeah. because I find myself, you know, it's like, well, I can't just just do it for the sake of doing something. Yeah. I, I have to make sure that I can explain to my fellow, mm -hmm. well, I'm thinking this because, yes, you know, such and such, I should have good clinical reasoning. Right. I should have some sort of base, you know, information. Um, so that keeps me on my toes. Yeah. You know, so I, totally I feel like I, I get more <laughs> out of, you know, being a part of uh, the Movement Science Fellowship. Yes, uh, definitely. You know, on the other side. Yes, yes, I definitely. think we become better teachers when we are being asked questions all the time. Mm -hmm. So we have to keep up with the young people, as I would say. <laughs> Which has been good, because mm -hmm. it keeps me sharp. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and I'm not afraid to say I don't know. Mm -hmm. Or I don't have all the answers, because people are... Uh, Sometimes, like you say, it sounds so, uh, the, the, the dysfunction or the treatment sounds like pretty easy, but you have to match it to the patient. Mm -hmm. And that's the art again. Mm -hmm. How do you talk? How do you convince the patient? It's like, how do you speak to them? Mm -hmm. And is this the right treatment for this particular person? Um, that's tricky. Yes. <laughs> yes. Even though you know evidence still tell you this actually works for let's say patellofemoral syndrome, mm -hmm. but you have to put it in context. Mm -hmm. I always think it's you got to put it in context. Mm -hmm. So yeah. well said, well said. Now, in addition to the fellowship training, um, you also provide continuing education courses yeah. uh, such as the Yonder Approach, the Dynamic Neuromuscular Stabilization, mm -hmm. and then your own Movement Links courses. Yes. So, how did Movement Links start? Movement Links actually is the way I practice. Okay. Uh, it's a combination of all the great teachers I've had. Mm. How I, from Shirley, from Yana, from, from Miguel, from Kolar, from manual therapy techniques mm -hmm. that I've been so ex in, uh, exposed to. So it's not one approach. Mm -hmm. It's, I would say, an integration. integration. Mm -hmm. So um, that's how, but the premise is basically looking at movement. Mm -hmm. So that's how it got started. Um, I, took a, I, I took a risk. I'm putting myself out there. <laughs> yeah, yeah. What a nice way to put it all together to, though, to to sort of take all of your mentors. Yeah. You know what what they've taught you. So, actually, before it got started, one of my former residents, one of my really early residents, he actually said, "Hey, Claire, you know you should integrate all the stuff because you're really good at integrating." Mm -hmm. I'm like, "No, no, no, no. I don't want to do that." <laughs> And you know, it's so funny because that happened, oh, I want to say, uh, more than 20 years or so ago that he actually put that little thought in my head, oh, but right. I didn't think it was even possible or I didn't even give any thought to it until maybe 10 years later mm -hmm. that it actually came to, that took the risk. Yes. <laughs> but it was because of this one guy who actually... Uh, Challenge me. Yeah, I'm so <laughs> glad he did. <laughs> because uh, us in Southern California, the, the physical therapists in Southern California certainly benefit uh, from, you know, Claire starting Movement Links. And uh, I hear it's the 10 year anniversary. Yeah, you uh, reminded me. <laughs> uh, this year. So That's she right. started this in 2008. So congratulations. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah. But you see how slow I was? It took me 10 years to even get it started. <laughs> The idea was all there. Oh, you're right. Yes, yes, yes. So now you have many instructors who also teach the Movement yes. Links course. Yes. Yeah. yeah, yeah, very good. Um, now you worked with the Chinese Olympic athletes in yes, Beijing. Yes, I was very privileged. Um, yeah. So um, um, you probably have a really good perspective um, for for athletes because you 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 are an athlete yourself uh, because of your badminton background. Yes. So. How is working with athletes 
you know, high level athletes, right, professional or Olympic level, similar and also different from patients okay. in the clinic? Well, as far as I'm concerned, the principles remain. Mm -hmm. It's the application to the different population changes. So I can show a very basic exercise like a bend knee fallout, for instance, to a um, person with low back pain mm -hmm. to control the uh, uh, to minimize the tail wagging the dog, mm -hmm. as Shirley would describe. Mm -hmm. I can also use that same exercise for a high-performance athlete for perhaps, as I would call it, as a reset or recovery. Mm -hmm. Because in high-level competition in sports, with rotational sports for instance, there is going to be extreme end ranges. And in when you're performing, there's no time to think of motor control. Mm -hmm. So as, after they've actually stressed that system, I should try to sell it to the, to the athlete, a bendy fallout or uh, other exercises that I do uh, to refresh, I call it kind of reset the system, bring it down, to dial it down, to get the, para the sympathetic nervous system calmed down, so to speak, mm -hmm. so that the the, the brain, the body can recover a little bit quicker. Mm -hmm. So if the athlete basically uh, can see it from that standpoint, I think that would be very helpful for them. Mm -hmm. But uh, as you can see, if you have someone who's Olympic level and they look at Benny fell out, they'll look at you like, oh, come on, girl. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, yeah. You're not going to tell me to do that, are you? <laughs> <laughs> I actually had a weightlifter do that. Uh, he had a lot of back pain. Mm -hmm. And I said, look, let's just do this. You've already tried all the other therapies. Uh, just let's try this. Do 10 repetitions on this. And I had him do quadruped rock mm -hmm. exercise. And he looks at me like, Tch. right. The next day, of course, I'm, I mean, I'm sure he's like, he's thinking, I'm sure when he left, he's like, this girl is nuts. <laughs> um, she thinks, is this going to work? It's, I'm pretty sure it's not going to work. Mm -hmm. But hey, <laughs> the next day they come in, mm -hmm. they say, hey, I, I'm feeling better, even though they don't want to admit it. So this is how I usually will sell it to them. This is, so consider this as a recovery exercise. Sure. So, yeah. So I hope I that answers that, your question. Yeah. Uh, so the principle, as, of, uh, as far as I'm concerned, is you got to know your principles. Mm -hmm. How you apply it to different populations will be different. Mm -hmm. And how you sell it or um, promote it to them um, it really depends on uh, the conversations you have with them. Yeah. So it all balls down again to... Yeah. <laughs> Back to connecting, Back to connecting with, with the patient, yeah. yeah, with the yeah. athlete or the patient. That's so true. Um, and, and there was the importance of that patient education. If they're not really understanding yeah. uh, what it is you're trying to teach them, it's, it's, gonna, it's just yeah. going to pass right by them. That's so. right. Now, do you th find that there's a cultural difference in how athletes train in China versus the American athletes? I think in China, because they're in a system, they have to, everything's collectively done. Mm -hmm. Whereas I think in the US, a lot more, the athletes are more individual, so they have their own coaches, they have their own trainers, it's very, very separate. Whereas in China, everyone has the same coach, especially if you're in, in, on an Olympic team. Mm -hmm. And um, so from that standpoint, that's a little bit different, like the U.S. is a little more individualistic, whereas in China, even though it could be an individual sport, but they're still a team. I it's see, a, that's a, interesting. So, um, there's a lot of, yeah, that's, I, I mean, I'm not an expert in that area, but this mm -hmm. is just what, um, the team comes first, mm -hmm. and then, mm -hmm. <laughs> in many ways, so it's quite different from the U.S. where you may be a team, but you still, it's still individual. Yes. That, yeah. Um, yeah, that's very interesting. My, um, for some reason, I have this image of, oh, there's, there's so many more athletes lined up if, if 
they can't make it to the Olympics. There's yes. like so many more. That's right. And so the pressure is tremendous on these Chinese athletes. Uh -huh. So from the time I was working there, I, I really have appreciated that the ones who actually make it to the, to get the, the to be the medalists, is a lot of survival of the fittest mm -hmm. because they have so many. Uh, the training is so rigorous, just like I always say in any sport, mm -hmm. not just in China, I mean in the U.S., whoever mm -hmm. becomes a medalist, who they, it's, they deserve it and earn it because of all their hard work. Mm -hmm. So from that standpoint, nothing beats hard work, right? Yes. Uh, I don't think any gold medalist will tell you that they just winged it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so. No way. Yeah. yeah. All right. Well, you're um, one of the reasons why I felt so much connection with you when we met was um, when you told me, oh, I'm from Malaysia. Yeah. And um, I said, that's so cool because I, I lived in Kuala Lumpur oh. uh, for three years during my teenage years. I went to middle school there. So um, I have so many great memories um, from those, those short years. Uh, wonderful people, and I miss the food so much. <laughs> yes. Um, but are you teaching uh, physical therapists in Malaysia? Yes, I am. Mm -hmm. uh, once again, this is. Um, I've been going back and forth there. I've been going to Malaysia for the last 10 to 12 years, mm -hmm. I believe. Mm -hmm. And let me tell you the story how it all started. Okay, yes. Is that okay? I love stories. <laughs> yeah. Uh, the day before I was, this was like 15 years ago, I think. Um, my sister calls me up and says, Hey, Claire, could you speak to a group of the nursing students? Because she's a, she was a nurse. She was in charge of the alumni for this big school. Mm -hmm. So I said, Sure. <laughs> <laughs> How do you turn down your sister? Oh, you, you can't. Yeah. I said, What do you want me to talk about? She said, Anything. Just tell them what physical therapy is. All right. So I said, oh, okay, I'll do that. So when I got there, um, it was supposed to be 50 nursing students. So I was just going to talk to them about what nursing student, what, what physical therapy is. So because nursing is, going to, is an inpatient, so I was going to come from the perspective of inpatients where it's important for patients to move, to get up and move. Mm -hmm. So, you know. Makes sense. Uh, yeah. So. To make a long story short, uh, her friends, who were, who were managers of various hospitals as well, mm -hmm. and so they told their PTs that this gal from the U.S. was coming to mm -hmm. speak, so invited their physios to attend. So before I know it, <laughs> it was supposed to be a small group of nursing students, 50 students I was told. It, that group became almost a couple hundred. Wow. With, I don't know, people from, I don't know, anyways. So, after my talk, um, I saw two ladies running down the, uh, the, 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 the room to meet me, to want to they introduce themselves as their phys physical therapist, and they invited me to go speak to their staff. Mm -hmm. And so I said, uh, yes, I will, I will, I will. I will speak to your staff on condition that you show me the place, the physical therapy clinic, because I've been gone from Malaysia for so long. Mm -hmm. I don't even I left Malaysia when I was a teenager, mm -hmm. so I don't even know what what physical therapy looks like in Malaysia. Mm -hmm. So they said that's not a problem. <laughs> so so I got to see what physical therapy uh, was as well as spoke to this group of 50 physios, the staff of PTs, yeah. and then got invited back every year. And so this is my gift back to the community. Yes. Uh, so it's been a privilege for me to go back mm -hmm. to Malaysia and mm -hmm. see how the profession is growing every time I go back. So it's been a pleasure. That is great. Now, what is their education process like? Okay, so in, um, they're right now in the process of getting to be a bachelor's degree. Mm -hmm. So in the past, it was more like diploma train. Okay. So I think in Japan, it's mm -hmm. the same. Now we in all technical schools, mm -hmm. is that correct? Yes, yeah, so you can either go to a four-year university yes. or uh, uh, 
a shorter PT school. Yes, yeah, so mm -hmm. Malaysia is similar. I see. So, but they're, tr um, but I think what they're trying to do is hopefully it becomes um, more a four-year program. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, a university degree. Yes, so and it's a it's a licensure that they would have to pass. I believe that's the direction they're going to. I'm not sure, but I think yeah. that's what they're trying to implement okay. in the near future. Okay. <laughs> Well, I think exciting. that's how the professionals will grow. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, let's see. So, so the follow-up question I think I was going to ask you, uh, from what you've seen, um, what do you think, um, how is PT practice and education different between the U.S., uh, Malaysia, and, and then some of what you've seen in, in China? Let's talk about Malaysia because mm -hmm. China is right now, I think, in the process of setting up physical therapy schools. Um, but Malaysia, basically, I think it's similar to Japan. There's mm -hmm. a technical, like, um, we call it diploma or the two or three year program and then a university degree. Um, in the US, it's a doctorate, entry level doctorate. So, from that standpoint, it's quite a little bit different, mm -hmm. much but longer, much longer. longer. Education. So I do know that um, the many PTs in Malaysia are actually going on to do their masters, mm -hmm. but and some of them are actually pursuing their PhDs as well. Mm -hmm. So as I can see, every year I go back, things are actually progressing more and more. So that's very encouraging. That is beautiful <laughs> too, yeah. and, and for you to be able to go back home and you know witness it yourself, yes. you know. Yeah. So, it's, to me, it's like a privilege. Yeah, yeah, I understand, <laughs> I understand. Um, how do you see physical therapy in the U.S. progressing in the next 10 to 20 years? Huh, I don't know, what did Shirley say? <laughs> <laughs> She's got it all figured out. She's got it. <laughs> I, I think I, I subscribe to what Shirley is a big proponent of that we, we become movement specialists, mm -hmm. um, that we take charge of the movement system. So until uh, we need to get our physical therapists better at the movement system. Mm -hmm. And so that's, I think that's where my heart is. And I don't know what's going to look like in 20 years, 10, 20 years, but I, just like you and Shirley, I want to have a lot of I want to play a part in helping that mm -hmm. move along <laughs> that way. Yeah, sure. And uh, for, for many years now, they've had this uh, diagnosis dialogue yes. going with ABTA. And now that we have a system that mm -hmm. identifies who we are as physical yeah. therapists, that if we could somehow come to some sort of agreement, yes. um, you know, that and to say, yes, we do make decisions, mm -hmm. you know, we can classify patients that's and right. treat accordingly. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, that's why I think that's you and I are in the same boat. We, mm -hmm. we want to see this grow. <laughs> we want to make Shirley proud, <laughs> right? <laughs> yes, we, so we Shirley, can. if you're listening <laughs> to this, we want to make you proud. <laughs> that is awesome. So, uh, moving on to some fun question, so stepping a little bit away from uh, career, uh, do you have a favorite motto? I think live, love, and laugh. Yay! <laughs> That's a good one. I try, uh -huh. you know, I try not to take t things too seriously because I'm such an intense person. People, my fellows would tell me I'm so intense and um, they always say, they always think I'm so intense because of this little frown that I have here. but. I have to tell, I okay. have to remind folks, actually I have a baby picture of myself, mm -hmm. one, one, a one-year-old picture where I actually had that frown there. You so, already had it? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so I always tell people, I was born with it. Wow. <laughs> no. I was just, I, I, I think I'm a pretty intense person, mm -hmm. so I, over the years, my children has really helped me chill out, as they would say. Mm -hmm. um, so I try to not take myself too seriously. So try, yeah. So I try. <laughs> I always have fun with you, Claire. Yeah, yes. So I'm trying. Yes. I'm not <laughs> trying. I think it, because I've made an attempt not to be so intense, it's actually uh, become part of me. Mm -hmm. So it's like, yeah. So that's. 
Right. And, and not to say having intensity can be a really good thing because when you really enjoy something, when you're mm -hmm. so passionate about uh, what you do, I think you need to bring on some intensity to, yeah. to make yourself better. And, yeah. yeah. Well, the intensity probably came from sports as well where, mm -hmm. you know, uh, having that game face on <laughs> so that your opponent don't see any weakness. And mm -hmm. So that's the part where mm -hmm. I've, I've learned to kind of let go though, mm -hmm. because life, you shouldn't take life, take yourself too seriously. Mm -hmm. yeah. If you lose, you lose. Good advice. <laughs> right? Yeah, there's always more. There's always more. <laughs> <There are> more. <laughs> you, can, you can lose more, or you can win some, or li live, and, live and learn mm -hmm. from the losses, and also learn, learn and live from the, the, uh, when you win. Yeah. yeah. So. You often learn so much more from yes. your loss anyways. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Uh, do you have any morning routine? <laughs> yes. Uh, first, like, what does the first 60 to 90 minutes of your day look like? I like to start my day really calm. Mm -hmm. So hopefully I don't wake up late. So usually mm -hmm. I like to have a really calm wake up earlier. Well, I've come to the point where my, my alarm clock, my brain clock, wakes me up mm -hmm. even before the, wow. before the alarm goes off. So my morning usually starts around 5, 5.30. Mm -hmm. And then I kind of mosey along, mm -hmm. and then if I don't have to go into work that morning, so early in the morning, my dog take her for a walk. Yes. And it's been a, a nice thing because she helps me unplug. Because I told myself when I take her for a walk, I'm not bringing my phone. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's so, so good. Uh, that's my time just to um, enjoy nature. Mm -hmm. Um, what about end of the day? Do you, I always struggle with end of the day because it's all oh, yes. variable, but do you have a end of the day routine? Not really. <laughs> <laughs> That's okay. Catch up with emails or, and then before I go to bed, read something uh, mindless. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. This, so, I, yeah. That's good. <laughs> That's good. Or watch a mindless show. Oh yeah, what are, you, what are you watching these days? Well, I've been watching, but this is not mindless because it's a pretty intense show. But I try to... Comedies will be fun. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, sounds good. Uh, what advice would you give to your 30-year-old self? I don't know. You know, you asked me that... Uh, I don't even know what I was doing at 30. I think at that time, I was planning to have kids. So. Okay, so, yes. What would I advise my 30-year-old self? I would say... I wish I was not so intense. Mm. I wish I would have just not be so bent out of shape if I didn't know everything. Mm. <laughs> and to take everything in stride... I don't know, I'm at a stage where I'm a lot... Um, more calm and mm -hmm. more secure in myself. Mm -hmm. like I think at 30 years old I was insecure. I thought I had to know everything and I didn't. And it would stress me out so much. So That's now good. if I That's don't know, advice. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm finding that it is okay to say yeah. I don't know. Uh, yeah. Uh -huh. so, yeah. yeah. So to my 30 year old self, uh, I think I would tell her to chill out. Mm -hmm. Good, <laughs> um, good call. Live, love, and laugh mm -hmm. more. Life yeah. is more than just work. Mm -hmm. so. yeah. And uh, can you please share books that you have enjoyed the most? Yeah, the books that I actually the last few years. Uh, I was very influenced by Henry Nouwen. Mm -hmm. uh, he was a, a, a Christian philosopher, monk. He talked a lot about listening to the heart, uh, listen to uh, the quietness of the soul. Mm -hmm. So that's been a big influence. So I try to go back to it when things are all crazy. Uh, it's like, how do I center myself again? Because mm -hmm. many times I think uh, when we get so busy, we get off center. So how do we get back to center? So that's one one book that's always been a uh, big influence. Not. He wrote many books, but mm -hmm. he's an author where I would say has influenced me trying to get back to center myself. I see.
But the other books I really have enjoyed the last few years, like uh, The Talon Code, The Sports Gene, okay. uh, Grit. I know you. I haven't read uh, Grit yet. Mm -hmm. And um, Brene Brown. Yes. So those the are researcher who yes. does uh, work on shame. That's right, on mm -hmm. shame. And she has this book that talks about, and I now I just slipped my mind, where she talks about. Uh, rising strong okay. where she talks about you know when we see people um, you know when we watch uh, an event or something we're like always think oh they could have done this better you know mm -hmm. criticizing this and that mm -hmm. but then the whole thing is uh, we should just maybe hush up because they are in the, at least they tried at least they are in the arena mm -hmm. so Kudos to them for even mm -hmm. trying. So, so this is where I'm at. Um, mm -hmm. So this has been, those are the fun books I've been yeah. very influenced. Yeah. What was the last name spelled of that first author that you mentioned? Nowen. N-O-U-W-E-N. Okay. Okay. All right. I'll have to look that up. Now, uh, uh, when did you start playing badminton? <laughs> and uh, <laughs> did you play other sports growing up? Yeah. I started playing badminton ever since I, I don't know as soon as I could hold a racket, mm -hmm. and that was just playing with my brothers and sisters, neighborhood kids, mm -hmm. and then I started formal training when I was ten years old, mm -hmm. which was a little late at that time mm -hmm. for badminton, because in Malaysia badminton kids start training at seven eight years old, mm -hmm. so ten years old I started training, uh, my high school my elementary school teacher, um, so we had so much fun. Because I just played because I, I just love mm -hmm. loved the sport. And then other sports, I played, I did anything. Anything that had a racket in my <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. But when I started to train seriously, uh, there were some sports where my coach would not allow me to play. So um, mm -hmm. tennis was one of them. That's true. Um, I, I think it, it wasn't good for me. I, I play tennis and it wasn't good for me to have fun on the, the badminton court yes. or worse like racquetball like yeah. those were not good yeah because it's a yeah and so I remember uh, getting chewed out mm. you know I would come to practice to badminton practice and when he would see me do my strokes because he knows what a stroke should look like mm -hmm. he immediately no, I know what you did this morning oh you got called out yes always <laughs> <laughs> so I was like, okay, I'm not playing that. <laughs> yes, yes. But other sports like ping pong, racquetball, uh -huh. which is fine because uh -huh. it's you know similar because of the wrist action, but not sure. tennis. Mm -hmm. uh, tennis is tough mm -hmm. on the wrist. And so, uh, of course, I played tennis as well, but then I forget to lock my wrist, and that's a problem. Oh, no. <laughs> I looked this up today that uh, the men's ranking right now, the number two player, is yes, from, from Malaysia. Malaysia yes. Yeah, um, and uh, yeah, lots and lots of top world yes. class players from Malaysia. Malaysia, mm -hmm. Indonesia, China. Mm -hmm. You know, there were, in the past it was a lot of Europeans. Uh, ja Japan. Japan's yeah. coming up. Yeah, oh, great J too. Japan and mm -hmm. South Korea. Mm -hmm. So, a lot of good badminton players. Yeah. Yeah, it's it's fascinating to watch the the yes. speed and yes. the the quickness, the power. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, are you still playing? Oh no, 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 no. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think my bones can handle it right oh. now. You know, I did go and play a few um, six, five years, six years ago, mm -hmm. and I told myself I'm going to go in nice and slow, because I know I'm. My, my body can't handle that speed and everything. But you know, I'll tell you what, the brain the, knows what it wants to do mm -hmm. because it remembers all the movements, what you, but the body <laughs> can't keep up. <laughs> that's so, true, that's true. Uh, so what exercises are you doing nowadays? I do a lot of body work, mm -hmm. uh, body, uh, body weight exercises mm -hmm. and walking. Mostly walking. Yes. So yes, yes. I try to be outdoors to get uh, as much as I can. Well, you have to take advantage of the fact that yes. we're in Southern California and yes. all the winter. It's super nice outside. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. 
And you went to Northern Illinois University for yes, yeah. undergrad. How did you choose NIU? They chose me. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Uh, and this was through badminton. Yes, yeah. they were re trying to recruit um, badminton players from Southeast Asia at that time mm -hmm. uh, to beef up their program. Mm -hmm. And so I was one of the candidates that was um, that was recommended by um, the association in Malaysia. Okay. And and here you Mirac are. Miraculously, I got selected, and uh, here that's how I ended up at NIU. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, but it must have been a huge adjustment, you know, going from yes. Malaysia. You're from Ipoh. Yes. Right to the Midwest, and I kind of experienced something similar yeah. coming from Osaka mm -hmm. to a little college in Iowa. Yeah. Um, what was that transition like? Was there a lot of culture shock? Um, culture culturally. My family is pretty Western, so it wasn't such a big culture shock. Mm -hmm. Of course, um, the thing that shocked me the most, I would say, was the, 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 the weather. <laughs> Coming from mm -hmm. 80 degrees, 85 degrees, to you know, the winters were just horrendously cold. Mm -hmm. So that was a big shock. But as far as, you know, I, I'm really happy I went to school in a small town. Because mm -hmm. I got to meet people who not city folk, so to speak. Yeah. So I got to, I feel I got to really experience the people from America. Yes. Um, um, to, to learn from them, because a lot of them, um, the town where I went to basically was a university town. Mm -hmm. So a lot of the people who work there um, work at university, but I got to know some wonderful people there. Mm -hmm. uh, just to hear their hearts, just listen to their stories, mm -hmm. so I think what, I, I feel like I had the best of both worlds. Yeah. Um, and I was, I, I feel like it was kind of cool because I was able to share with them, because many of them, the, when this was 30 years ago, had never met someone who was from another country. Mm -hmm. And so for them, to to experience to for them for me to share with them my life growing up in another country mm -hmm. as a, and then coming to the states as a foreign student mm -hmm. international student it was just a lot of sharing together yes so I feel like it was like a bridge making mm -hmm. between mm -hmm. uh, the folks that I was surrounded with as well as the, uh, for them as well as for me yeah. Yeah, yeah, I had a great, um, I was lucky to have a wonderful host family, my yeah. host parents at Grinnell. I still keep in touch with them. Uh, and of course, everybody in, you know, a small town, Iowa, it's so, they're, they're so friendly. Yeah, so, that's right. So I, I just remember being so shocked the first weekend. Yes. I was walking down the sidewalk and this older couple, I think they must have just gotten out of church mm. on a Sunday, and they just happily greeted me, yeah. and I just said, oh, do I know you? <laughs> <laughs> no one in Osaka greets yes, strangers, exactly. you know, on the yeah. street, so. I re yeah, I remember this, this gal, her son, um, they're Ita Italians. Mm -hmm. The first time I met them, her son gave me a big hug. It was like a 10-year-old kid. Mm -hmm. And, I, you know, growing up in Malaysia, we, we don't hug. <laughs> <laughs> and I just remember, I, I, I think he, he hugged me so warmly, and I think I was, I just stood there like a, like a, like a stick. Because I didn't know what to do. Yeah, yeah. But what do you do for fun aside from physical therapy? Oh, right now, as I said, I think... Or gardening, mm -hmm. I've taken it up last few years, just to get in touch with Mother Nature again. So get my hands dirty in yeah. the soil. Yeah. So, um, so it's been uh, really fun. Not fun. I don't know what I'm doing, but I've learned as I've uh, gone along. Uh, I think the thing that really, I I always thought I had I had. Um, I don't have green thumbs, for sure. Well, you must be doing something, right, if you're getting homegrown tomatoes. Yeah, so yeah. that was my incentive. Great. After you start yeah. growing and I start tasting what real tomatoes should taste like, mm -hmm. I'm like, okay, I think I'm going to grow more. Mm -hmm. And then that expanded to an herb garden. That's so, wonderful, yeah. Um, 
Good, and then some vegetables. Okay. Not nothing big, but just yeah. enough for me as a hobby. All right. <laughs> Let me know when I can come over for some salad. Then. All right. <laughs> Now, uh, where can uh, people find you on the internet or social media so they can find out uh, when and where is your next course? Okay, um, you can look me up uh, under movementlinks.com mm -hmm. uh, and so we have courses and someday, um, yeah. Yeah, and do you, are you on Twitter, Facebook, Yeah. that sort of fun yes. stuff? Yes, Facebook. Uh, and Twitter, uh -huh. Instagram are actually all managed by by my my coworkers, oh, wonderful staff. Yes, my my team members, because mm -hmm. I'm not a big social media person. Mm -hmm. um, but as I say, we have to live in this day and age mm -hmm. where social media is a big deal. So mm -hmm. I try to I try to learn what I can, mm -hmm. but I'm trying not to let it consume me. Mm -hmm. There's a fine line. There's a fine line. <laughs> Um, lastly, you know you have a big audience in Japan, yeah. and uh, you've been teaching in Japan with Hideko Ogura Sensei yeah. uh, for many years now. So, um, any message for the Japanese movement professionals, and then when will you be back in Japan? Oh, okay. Actually, I'll be back in July or okay. August this okay. year. Okay. So I think I'm going to Japan like twice a year now. Great. Um, as far as the Japanese physios. Continue to with your passion. I would say uh, I love I love going to Japan. Uh, everyone's so respectful, so gracious, and the ones who show up in classes truly, really mm -hmm. want to learn, and they'll stay as long as you will. You, you, you want to be there, mm -hmm. and I just love the zeal. Uh, I think you've experienced that. Mm -hmm. Just so eager to learn. Yes, and I hope to see more and more. Um, Japanese PTs actually uh, teaching more of this stuff. Mm -hmm. I think that's a big goal. Yes, <laughs> that yes. we we empower the nationals to continue the work or to start or continue the work that uh, we all have been trying to to do over here in the states. Mm -hmm. So yeah, <sighs> wonderful. Yeah, well, I think that wraps up this uh, uh, conversation. I won't call it an interview. <laughs> Thank you so much, Claire, for, for your generous you. time. And uh, I continue to learn from you so much. So Thank you, Michael. Um, you guys, everybody, make sure to check out her uh, textbook that she co-authored. It is called Assessment and Treatment of Muscle Imbalance, The Yanda Approach. And uh, go visit movementlinks.com uh, to find out uh, you know, courses offered in, let's say, Los Angeles. Newport Beach, San Francisco, Oregon, and New York. Yes. You're, you're headed to New York pretty soon. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Well, safe travels. Thank you. And we'll, uh, we'll see you guys soon. Yep. Thank you very much. Bye.